Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, now that we know yeah. the Silk Road doesn't exist, we kind of have to go back and it does. try to it does. it. It does. Um, I'm challenging this, uh, <laughs> my, my question to this you, British traveler. To, to you, gentlemen. You, you're, you're, done. you're not going to get a word in here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't agree with a word I said on that, do you? No, I, I agree that strategically it's very difficult to put these pieces together. And yeah. that's the danger. People are trying to put things together that it's, don't fit. It's, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to put a coherent, agreed by everybody, package together about this huge chunk of the globe. It's impossible politically. Because you have all the big powers of today's world and tomorrow's world competing over this fundamental piece of landmass of the world. You have all the big players, US, a little bit of Europe. You have China, you have India, you have Russia. You have also other players that we have not mentioned here, uh, like Korea and Japan, who are financing projects in these regions, regions uh, in a very abundant way. But where I challenge Richard is exactly where he believes he's strongest, on the economic side. Because if I look to the numbers of money which is pouring into projects in this region. $30 billion of investment package from China to Kazakhstan alone. We have Shashi Tarur from India, our, our great intellectual and friend from India, and he knows that even if there are difficulties in the two big projects connecting Central Asia across Afghanistan towards Pakistan and India, the Tapi gas line, of course, it's still difficult to be made, but it's a huge project with strategic uh, consequences. If you look to this big hydropower plant, which is supposed to connect Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and deliver energy to uh, Afghanistan, that's a huge project. If you look to the, the Asian Development Bank, ask them the tens of billions of dollars which are invested in various railroad, uh, transmodal transportation. So this it does exist, but not in one single concept. Ah. It's a myriad of small silk roads. Exactly. It's a myriad of small, the small silk roads. And the question is for a European or an American, because we also represent here the West in a way, are we supposed to do anything about this, or we just let it in a sort of a natural way to grow in which, whatever direction uh, and I suggest one the latter. or the other could do? I suggest the latter. And I suggest the latter, because if you try and do the former, you are destined to fail. It, you have two models there. You have one that looks at the region and thinks that you need a strategic plan to approach it. China and US. Both have their own version that is enshrined in policy, in state policy. The other one may be more organic, um, led by um, institutions like the Asian Development Bank, um, or by individual companies doing investment in the region. Um, either two mo these two models incompatible, or is there something in between? I don't know. I, I was listening to our friends from Kazakhstan yesterday. They have a big refinery in Romania. So, on the western side of the Black Sea. And the guy working for that company told us yesterday that this Kazakh company has invested and it's owning if I understood correctly, the, one of the ports in Georgia, on the eastern side of the Black Sea. And then they build their own oil tankers just to ship oil from Kazakhstan all the way to Romania, near the port of Constanza, in their refinery. So, is this a Silk Road project or not? No. Richard would say no. I would say yes. No, I would say it's a project that makes economic sense because of the situation. You want to give it a big stamp of some sort of... Of course, this is my line of business. So you should not <laughs> delete my brand here because I've been working on this one, damn it. Of course, I'm teasing Richard now. So strategically, it's impossible to have a conciliation between the diverging views of the big strategic global players. Hillary Clinton and our Chinese friend yesterday was very outraged that somebody dared to use the terminology of the Silk Road, which is Chinese uh, 
let's say, intellectual property, so to speak, and political property. No, Hillary Clinton, in 2011, referred to the New Silk Road exclusively as a strategy to stabilize Afghanistan. And she said, and there was a certain, let's say, correctness in that analysis, that if we want to stabilize Afghanistan, we have to have the neighborhood cooperating with Afghanistan, which is an enclaved country. And that's why Central Asia, India, Pakistan, all these neighbors, China in a way, they should be, be part of the project. The Chinese were upset, not for a good reason with Hillary Clinton, eventually former pre future president, because the Americans were not thinking of connecting Europe to Asia. They were thinking of stabilizing Afghanistan after NATO would have left. And this is, this is something that we like here from Bucharest to talk again to our American and European friends in Washington and Brussels and Berlin and Berlin and to say, listen, if Europe and America will not be investing for projects that make economic sense, I'm not saying to, in to invent uh, a building like this across the Silk Road. This is nonsense, economical, political and strategical. But if America and Europe will continue to be absent from this region, if we'll continue to say this is not our business anymore, if we leave this for the competition between China, Russia and India, which is taking place as we speak, do you think that Prime Minister of India in Washington these very days, this is not some sort of game where America tries to balance the rise of China in a way? Yes, it is. And if we are not understanding this in such a way, it means that we are naive or we don't understand uh, that logic. So what I'm just trying to say, Europe has Tracheca. This is the Trans-Caucasus yeah, yeah, yeah. Central Asian project. I want more money into this. I want to see the ports and airports and connecting grids uh, that make economic sense. Uh, no, getting on, some on, fresh on, money. But, right, I want but, the U.S. to appropriate no, oh, more money for Just a minute, this. just a minute. Sorry, I realize this is your job, but my old habits die hard. I'm the provocateur now. No. You want to see more money, and I want to see more money, but why do you want to see more money? Do you want to see more money because it's a project that makes sense, that will advance the economies of that particular region, that it will create jobs, create wealth, or do you want to see money for some geopolitical purpose? Do you want to see this, this project? That it will sim you're playing a larger chess game than, than that. You have a greater strategy involved. No. I tend to be pragmatic here. Oh, so you're agreeing with me? Yes. And you would I get want, to that. I want, I, want, I want a wallet which is much fatter than the one I have today as Perfect. a country. We agree. And for that, I need to diversify my, my markets. I, for that, I, I need to use my geography. I'm not in the position as a relatively medium-sized country in the region to impact on the global balance of power. This is not my business. My business is to be a loyal ally of my Western friends. And my job is to make my citizens live better and have more business coming through and from Romania. This is my business. But at the same time, um, one of the underlying risks that Richard was uh, mentioning is that we'll be, we're dealing with a region where uh, creating more communication actually imports potentially instability, whether it's Islamic terrorism or other sorts, but also that there's an inherent, um, almost ethical risk of dealing with um, um, a region where this, not necessarily the same norms apply that the ones we would like to see applied right. in our region. How do we deal with this difficulty? Well, my problem, Richard and Andre, my problem is not the fact that this thing is not happening. My problem is that Romania might be circumvented from this thing which is happening. I agree. Because look at HP, Hewlett Packard. They have 80% of their manufacturing in Western China. All of it is shipped by train across Kazakhstan, across Russia, all the way to the Netherlands in Rotterdam, and then is distributed globally. This is happening every week in Poland. We have seven train operations coming from China across Russia. The northern part of the Silk Road is happening as we speak. It's abundant. It's happening. Why? Because if you want to ship a container from unruly Hong Kong to, let's say, Rotterdam, if you go through this situation, you spare 2,200 maritime miles in one week in time of transportation. That's why. 
And the, the other one is happening as we speak through Turkey. It's happening. Uh, even if Iran is quasi-embargoed, uh, there is business going there. My problem as a country, and this is why I want to have these conferences and encourage people to look at Romania as this medium corridor because it's a trifurcation of the Silk Road. It's coming from China and then to Kazakhstan and Central Asia and then it's going north but you towards that. Russia, south towards China, uh, towards Turkey, and then this thing across the Black Sea from Georgia, Azerbaijan, to the heart of Europe, to Italy. Was the Chinese uh, friend yesterday mentioning Italy? Of course to Italy, because that's where Marco Polo started. Because it's the same damn geography. Right. But you do that, surely, as you are doing, sir, and what this forum does so elegantly. What it does is identifying the reasons why. Here we go. That's the core part of this issue. And the danger is that we become transfixed. And I've learned this over many years with doing business journalism. You know, 25 years, pretty much since this building was put up. Let's hope that uh, <laughs> I last a bit longer. Um, no. Most people or most academics, and most, they love immediately delve into the geopolitical. They adore it. They can spend hours discussing the minutiae of the chess pieces on the, ta uh, on the board of what this means for the US, for China, for Turkey, for Kazakhstan, for Iceland, whatever. But what I agree completely with you, you've got to look from a country's point of view of how do we get the business? What do we need to do without completely selling our morals down the river? What customs barriers need to be opened up? Which individual treaties do we need to negotiate? How far do we need to deal with India on that? Do we need Now, it's very difficult at one level for a small or medium-sized country to do it bilaterally, which is why you have the EU uh, on your doorstep or doing it in theory for you. To, but, but what you don't do is, you, you've, it's where you start, and I agree with you, sir, you start from what do we do to get that third route through. Yesterday, we had a couple of Romanian minister, cabinet ministers on this very stage. And I want to, first of all, look into my own situation as a country. If I want to become a small piece of the action. So, Romania today, gets from the total trade coming from Asia to the European Union less than 1% of that business. Okay, I'm not saying we should get 50%, but damn it, a little bit more of that chunk of business already happening, and will continue to grow this business because you cannot stop the Asian economies to grow, and you cannot stop the European Union, US free trade zone to, to happen just because it's a matter of of physics, not geopolitics, it's a matter of, of business. Good. So if in Romania you have the railroad average speed of 20 kilometers per hour, and the Netherlands has 80% average speed for freight transportation, this is something that Romania will not be in the position to be competitive. If I'm not using my ports uh, on the Black Sea and the Danube, tremendous ports on the maritime Danube where today the largest river port in the world is Duisburg in Germany. They have an interest in investing in the port of Galatz, which is the, uh, a maritime uh, port, on, uh, 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 a river port on the maritime Danube. And of course, we're encouraging this, this private operation to happen. Romania doesn't have a container railroad, rush, wide railroad from Russia and the, the smaller one from Europe in, in, in any of those locations. So the first thing I need to do as a Romanian decision maker and the guys who are here, the Prime Minister and the others, we have to really decide where do I put my money first? Yes. Because my money is limited. I, it's not unlimited money. EU money, national money, private money. And I think we should have this critical path trying to make Romania's infrastructures from fiber optics to multimodal transportation from the, uh, the train station of Bucharest, Mircea, to everything else in Romania, and then I start 
competing to get more than 1% of the trade happening as we speak between Asia and Europe. So this is, this is in fact my challenge. And then, excuse me, Andre, then I have to go to my immediate neighbors, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Azerbaijan, these guys, Turkey, and say, okay, what kind of projects, bilateral projects, can we finance together or attract money to, to find? I need a highway between Odessa and Galatz, I was mentioning, to you connect Ukraine to Romania. We are not connecting to Ukraine. This is how you know. it's done. This so piece by piece, this project by project, the Silk Road is, is taking shape. But it takes shape organically. Organically, I agree. It takes shape because an individual project makes sense. So the Russia-China pi uh, pipeline project that was announced, the most expensive in the world, who the hell knows if it will ever be built? Yes, but I know that the pipeline from Turkmenistan to China, that, that, that uh, Turkmenistan is exporting 9 billion cubic meters of gas to China in a contract. And I know Turkmenistan, with all the human rights record, which is not impeccable, they also go towards Europe, even if they have this relationship with Gazprom. And they, they, are, they are coming to Romania and say, let's do business. And Romania sometimes is not able to do business with players like this that want to diversify. This is real business. Yes. This is not strategic business. Gazprom is playing strategic business. And they, they will get burned in the process. And they will get burned in the process. No South, Stream, South Stream is an exorbitant project. The money that a normal company will never put the $15 billion to build a pipeline under the Black Sea all right. the way and to Italy just to bypass Romania and to bypass the allies of America. This is, makes no this? economic sense. But for Gazprom and, 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 and Russia, it makes sense right. because they want to make sure that Europe is kept captive. To, on their dependency, uh, our well, dependency on Russia. And, and the one point I, I'm going to make on, on, on this, you want to know how grotesque this gets, what you're saying. You end up with the gas problems, and because of the strategic issues, Ukraine, sanctions, you end up with the gas problems, the VTBs, the spur banks of this world, who are now facing the only form of financing because of EU sanctions from their own central bank, from the Russian central bank, because they're cut out for more than 30-day uh, paper from the commercial markets. And what's the effect of that? Well, of course, the Russian central bank now has 75 to 80, 100, uh, eight, to 80 to 100 billion dollars of financing that it's going to have to find over the next six months. So you're, you're far better off, and I agree with you, you're far better off individually, piecemeal, collect, rather than this collective idea. You've been, I'm so sorry, you've been... That's okay, don't worry, I'm, I'm used to this. Um, the biggest question in that respect is how do you fight the, the, you know, the risk of looking at exclusively through geopolitical lenses. Your own um, TV station looks systematically at the region with a strategic angle. How do you talk to, to investors? Because all these opportunities need significant investment, both private and public. So what is the type of, of, of uh, if you want, information that you, can, you want to push out to kind of create a, a narrative of a successful potential um, economic drive for creating a new go, You go back to basics. It's not rocket science. You, you can make it as, I mean, I, I say this to my colleagues at CNN, you can make it as complicated as you like. You really can. I have producers who will happily, I would use a rude word, but I'm not gonna, since, since we're on the record here, uh, I'm not gonna use it. I've got producers who will happily spend hours looking at the minutiae of this latest Putin position versus Ukraine versus this versus that. Well, that's the province of other people. And I tell my producers, no, all my viewers want to know tonight is what happened and why does it matter? That's basically it. What happened and why does it matter? The who, what, where, when and why. Basics. And it's the same with investment. People will put money into a project if it makes sense. And they will put money into a project because they see a future ev evolving. And that's the same as the host, the, the, the Margaret Thatcher and the, 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 the grocer's daughter with her handbag. You know, I want my money back. If it makes sense, they'll put money into it. 
If it doesn't make sense, they won't. If it makes potential sense, and there's a potential risk, the government will come in and help along a little bit because there might be too much risk for the private sector to take on, on board. We might, we might have, God forbid, the UK telling us next year in the referendum about the EU membership or not. I want my whole thing back, and this will be complicated. Let, let, me, let me answer to, to Richard's provocation. I was part of this, um, let's say, gang of uh, strategists and politicians that are looking, let's say, from Venus to, to, to such a project. And I learned the hard way that the only way to go about it is to have the investment value proposition in each of the small deals that you can eventually get. This is why we, as the Aspen Institute, I would like again to thank all the, our members and all our corporate members for supporting the idea of lending professional expertise from the private sector to the government in this what we call Romania Gateway Unit, which is a bunch of top officials and cabinet members in the key ministries working together with a group of professionals in trying to identify the exact deals and business proposition and export uh, uh, markets that we can eventually do in a very practical way. What yesterday you heard from the Prime Minister, and this is something that's why I accepted to be part of such an exercise, is that I understand that the grand thinking is not good enough anymore. And it's even worse than that. You get trapped into your own ambition, which is nice. It's a sort of a romantic escape from the relatively small size economy that we are. And instead of basically fantasizing about the greatness of Romania or the greatness of Ukraine or the greatness of any of our neighbors, I would prefer to say which is the next business I can do. Where is the next investor I can bring to Romania? Where is the next cluster I can populate with business? Where is the next export destination I can do? How can I help my exporters to mitigate risk in a troublesome region? And this is where the Romanian government or any government or through Exim Bank or any other things uh, should really accompany these this, this risk takers, these adventurers against political bandits or whatever kind of historical uh, uh, analogy we can find. You're agreeing with me. I agree with you. That's why I want you back to Romania. I still, I, I'm not going to leave you gentlemen um, that easily off the hook because investments are not all created equals. And um, as Richard mentioned, as we discussed yesterday, um, um, the, the, the pitfall here is uh, the temptation of um, illiberal tendencies, of forgetting that ultimately this is about uh, not just doing good business, but doing um, business that actually serve um, um, a societal purpose. And the region is rife with regimes, with um, ideas that are challenging uh, the, what we thought a liberal, uh, value-based, uh, democratic Europe um, should stand for in Europe, not just in the region. Oh, please, call a spade a shovel. What are you saying? Well, I Come suppose on, what I'm name it, name it, come on. Well, I suppose what I'm saying is that um, unless you stand up to tendencies of, of um, um, using state institution to kind of grab power um, with or without the limits of constitution. You know, what, Hungary? Is Hungary included? But it's not the only country. Sorry? It's not the only country. No, the but when you've got, there, no, but when you've got you one, <laughs> but when you've got one of the countries, and I'm sorry if this makes some people in this room feel uncomfortable, but if, when you've got one of the countries in the European Union coming out with a speech and talking about illiberal democracies and, saying that, and, and mentioning with a certain amount of favor elsewhere, other countries full fair, and nobody in Europe seemingly wanting to talk about it and say anything about it. Maybe because the problem is bigger than that. Maybe the problem is not just Hungary or one particular leader, but rather um, a fundamental problem in Europe of dealing with this. The problem is the huge fatigue of the European project and you have, let's say, new versions of populism arising everywhere. Correct. And for, for us, it's not such a surprise that this kind of new forms of populism arise in our region because we are still fragile. We are still societies in the making. But when I see countries far more established, far richer than we are, uh, so 
basically ready to vote in large numbers extreme radical populist politicians in, in, and, and to have them in governments and basically have this, this new tendency towards Europe, I'm really worried and sometimes even scared. This is the club we wanted to join? This is the kind of society we want to build over here? Can I see my mentors? My mentors. Western Europe is my mentor. American democracy is my mentor. And I see everywhere, including in the developed West, a sort of derailment, a sort of a, a, a fatigue of even the democratic process. And this is something that for us is scary. Because my geography is the extreme vanguard of the West. I'm in a spot that is still vulnerable. And of course we have NATO and American bases and whatever we have over here, but fundamentally I'm still exposed. I'm, I'm coming back to, to our project. What I really would like to see, these countries in our region, going to the new commission, going to Juncker, going to, uh, to uh, Mogherini, going to Moscovici, going to all these guys, and say, listen, if we want to mean business, speaking of Richard's show on CNN, in this part of Europe, if you want to be relevant towards Eurasia, not to speak of the Silk Road per se, but if Europe is absent from this place where global competition and eventual cooperation is taking place, it means that Europe is designed to basically cease to exist at the pretense of a global power. Of course, we don't have a military strong, but we still have a strong economic thing. And I think the obligation we have is to go to Brussels, to the new commission, to go to Berlin, to go to London, to go to Paris, to go to Rome, to go to Warsaw, and say, L what do we do about this middle corridor? How do we stabilize this route? Silk Road or not, this is a dangerous place. George Friedman was saying that basically you can see a connection between the Ukrainian crisis and what we see with ISIS or ISIL yeah. there. Not because they are connected, but geographically they are part of the same, the same problem. So if I look at this situation from the Black Sea shores, I'm worried and I would like to have a combination. This is where I d d differ a little bit from Richard, to see very pragmatic, business-oriented uh, investments, but also some form of grand strategy that to say at least U.S. Ah. and U.S. and ah. Europe, we are not moving out from the very place where the shape of global balance the, is, is where, happening as we where speak. Where I can agree, and this is where I think Romania can play a vital part, in a European Commission, I mean, Pierre Moscovici said to me, forgive me name dropping, but he said, you heard me say at dinner last night, he, his exact words in an interview with me last week were, this new European Commission is the last chance for the European project. Now, he may be talking his own book, but it's, it, 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 you know, he, he makes a good point. And he has a good point. Europe has got an enormously heavy agenda, and unlike the United States with its unitary government, system, although with Congress versus uh, the, the White House, it does have a single government which speaks by and large with one voice when it finally does speak. Europe has, it takes almost a genocide and a war for Europe to actually speak with one voice, as we're seeing in uh, Ukraine, as we saw, uh, we're seeing with ISIS. To your point, Romania can lead or at least be at the front of that debate on what happens in the middle. It is a perfect, a perfect subject area for a country like Romania to say, do you know something? We've got the values that you all espouse to. We do. We'll carry the flag on that one. But we're, we're speaking in this house 25 years after the fall of the communist regime. And Europe and the West generically succeeded in, in making that peaceful transition. Yesterday night, we discussed about the, the dual challenge that Europe may not be able to face at the same time. Reinventing its funda economic fundamentals and addressing geostrategic, geopolitical crisis. How do we go about that? For the same reasons that this country has got growth pains and growth 
whatever you want to call them, uh, troubles from 20, only being 25 years old. The EU, frankly, is not that much older, 50 years, 40, 50 years. And certainly in its new guise of 10 plus 2 plus 1 is only 20 odd, 25 years, 20 odd years since it's been a size, heft, Maastricht, Stability Pact. And six of those years have been spent deep in recession. So we've got to write six to eight years off because six to eight years have been spent putting out the fire. So you try and build the house while you're putting out the fire and I promise you it's not that easy. The analogy I used last night at dinner, you try and change the aircraft engine while the plane's flying and see what happens. So Europe is having to learn while while the cake is, oh, this is great, I've gone from building houses to putting out fires to aircraft engines to cakes baking. It doesn't matter which one you pick, they all make the same point. You've got to do it while it's happening in real time. Let me, let me, let me pick up on this point, because, because everybody, especially in our part of Europe, with our historical, let's say, paranoia about instability and global players fighting over our territory. In a funny way, speaking of a European Union, and I hope a synchronized policy with the US, synchronized, not I identical, you yes. cannot have an identical thing, but at least synchronized, talking to each other. Listen, I'm trying to, to engage India for that reason. I think this should be a conversation also with Europe, say, listen, okay, what about India in this global balance which is now taking shape uh, Coming back to Europe, funny enough, many people are concerned about this traditional German-Russian relationship, which is a sort of harmonica of love and hate, of cooperation and competition. And of course, for good reasons, some people are concerned if this could not lead again to some form of new version of some form of dominance over the uh, region between the Baltic and the Black Sea. This is a concern that comes from Estonia all the way to Romania, uh, uh, Poland, of course, a large country, in, in a large player into this situation uh, being included. I would argue the opposite, because Germany is a major exporter. Germany is a country that will encourage any form of free trade and flow of goods, because this serves as you mentioned yesterday, during over dinner, the huge industrial base that Germany has. And the huge industrial base that Germany has as a hinterland all over Central Europe, including in Romania. They need to grow. They need to export. They need markets to be expanded. So in a funny way, even if there is a sort of uh, uh, concern and a little bit of, uh, of, of care that Germany has when it comes to Russia, I can guarantee that Germany has a direct interest for this middle corridor, not a zero per se, this middle corridor to be open for business. So I think we have a chance for Romania taking the flag, but not only the only flag, because we don't carry yet enough influence, but to have a small coalition within Europe, like the Eastern Partnership was led by Poland and Sweden, with backing from Germany and other players, I think we should do the same Create a coalition from countries in the region, go to Berlin, go of course to Paris, to Rome, to London, to the other big players, go into the, this commission, which I think has a couple of great names within, great names, like Moscovici is a good name, you have, uh, you have a couple of, Juncker is an experienced politician, so you have a couple of people to, 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 to whom you can talk to, and then come back in the next few months with the beginning of a practical strategy where the EU is engaging this region in a very practical way, saying, I have money for the ports and airports. I have money and I want to invest in the modernization of your customs systems. I want to be there with you and help your civil servants being less corrupt if it's possible. All these kind of practical things that Europe can do because the soft power of Europe could be useful in a place where hard power will continue to be, to be played between the players that have and the muscle you, and, the, and the might to be doing that. I guarantee you, that will pay more dividends than any form of um, President Xi turning up in numerous stand countries promising this 
offering that, discussing the other. It's a not an either or, it's a both, but, it's a, but it is also a race. And you better get your act together. Right, we have four more minutes, and I oh. do have a couple of questions that make it a little bit more difficult for you to um, One, sanctions. We're, we're, we're talking in Romania, a few hundred miles from the Ukrainian border, um, and, and the, the biggest, if you want, response, the most important response that Europe and US could agree upon um, to, to stand up to this non-militarily was um, sanctions. Um, nothing hinders business more than this on both sides. So how, how do you see them in terms of effectiveness? How do you see, see them in terms of um, what impact they're going to have, um, not just for the new Silk Road, but for Eurasian business in general? They were designed to send a warning. They were designed in a classic cooker fashion to turn up the heat. And you had sanctions one. Nothing happened. Sanctions two. Sanctions three. We're now on to going up to sanctions four. The issue, of course, is are we trying to play one game whilst the other side is playing another? Are we cooking with gas and he's using electricity? And if that's the case, then we can ratchet the gas up to turbo power. And then all you're really hoping for is that on the other side, others finally say, enough pain, because he ain't going to. President Putin is not suddenly going to turn around. And in the same way that Chancellor Merkel, and she did when Sanctions 1 came along and Sanctions 2, when, she, when, when as Chancellor Merkel basically said to German exporters, just shut the up. We're going to get on with this. We're doing this for a particular reason. I don't want to hear another word out of you. I mean, she put it slightly differently, but that was the gist of it. President Putin put it slightly more bluntly to his. He's locked up one of his oligarchs as a warning of what happens if likely if you start messing around. But it's the same concept. Eventually, somebody's going to call chicken. I think that uh, the Russian economy is, is fragile. Um, to me, the question is not if the sanctions will uh, deter President Putin from continuing to do what he thinks is best for the national interest of Russia, because I think this will not deter him. But the real question is, do we craft a policy where deliberately we take away in a significant amount, the number one weapon that Russia has today, which is not nuclear, but energy. This economy is fully dependent on export of raw materials and energy-related commodity. So, if there will be, and here US and other countries close to the US and also European Union to a certain extent, we could really make up our own minds and say, listen, enough is enough of this blackmail. And if we start diversifying, and if we start buying from other places, if the US Congress will allow LNG, American gas, to be exported, let's say, towards Europe, if we continue to invest into the Eastern Mediterranean uh, reserves, if we use Romania's resources, which are not small, they're significant, then at a certain moment, we can really reach a moment when not sanctions, but a deliberate economic policy will really hurt Russia for the long term. I don't think we should reach that point, because when you go, speaking of the fact that we are understanding each other differently, because somebody who has so much power and is at the height of his power, like Putin is, they don't react to normal impulses like let's say, a liberal democracy, or not yet illiberal democracy in Europe, uh, is reacting to, or the American president. We'll see what's happening with the US Senate in the next few weeks, or a few days. We'll see if they stay Democrat-controlled uh, or, or Republican. So the problem is, do we really understand 
that Russia's might comes from this kind of exports, and if we can find an alternative to that. The rest, sanctions are good because they are biting a little bit, because some people are worried in, in, in Russia, because the oligarchs are scared, because they, their whereabouts in, in the West could be threatened. But I think that in the end, we should really have, not us, we are too small, but mainly Americans and a few other players like Germany, like others, they say, listen, we would like to find a middle of the road with you guys. We'd like to find a way to continue to work in a decent way with a big player like Russia. But if you continue to play this hardball with us, we'll have to go to the real instrument of power that we have, which is the price of energy at the global level. And the real diversification in 5, 10 years, 15 years of the European huge lucrative market from your exports of this kind of things. And at that moment, even Putin or his successor, whoever that successor might be, because that successor will come. And I think that successor will come relatively soon because that's a cycle of power, even in illiberal democracies. And at that moment, I think Europe and the US have to really speak with one voice, even if the German exporters are not having the same interests like the, let's say, energy co corporations in America or, let's say, French business doesn't have, they don't have the same interest, but here, and my last point is, next year, I come back to the British subject, the UK, UK EU membership problem. We should not underestim underestimate, I think, the risk that the British public, despite the Scottish referendum and the lessons learned, I think, from that referendum, that Europe, European Union, without the UK within, is a much weaker project. And of course, I can understand the frustration of the British public uh, for the bureaucracy in Brussels, the lack of transparency in what they do, to the fact that many decisions, uh, including you know, the, the system of capitalism, if you want, are uh, influenced by some bureaucrats in Brussels. But if we can do anything to keep the UK inside, I think we should try to do it. Because without the UK, European Union, as a global player, is a project that basically I don't think has the ingredients to fly high. And from a smaller country, a newer arrival into the EU, I want the European Union to be a successful project. I don't want to join an organization which is coming towards its end while I... <laughs>